I wanted to play a little bit of your misogyny speech from TikTok. <laughs> okay. I will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny by this man. I will not. And the government Order. will not be lectured about sexism Order. and misogyny by this man. Not now, not ever. The Leader of the Opposition says that people who hold sexist views and who are misogynist are not appropriate for high office. Well, I hope the Leader of the Opposition has got a piece of paper and he is writing out his resignation. Because if he wants to know what misogyny looks like in modern Australia, he doesn't need a motion in the House of Representatives. He needs a mirror. I'm a bitch. I'm a boss. I'm a bitch and a boss. I'm a shine like us. <laughs> so surreal sitting here with you listening to that because I remember where I was when you gave that speech. Um, we were in our first Mamma Mia office and we were all crowded around the television and it was such a moment. It was such an extraordinary moment. All these young women watching you say that. And it was a time, it's funny to look back at it now because Tony Abbott, you know, I mean, Donald Trump makes Tony Abbott look like Gloria Steinem in terms of, <laughs> of how mild he is by what was to come in the future. But there was such a sense of anger and fury among women about how you were, of all sides, about how you were being treated. But it's, what's interesting about the last line of that, not your speech, but the TikTok that goes with it, which I just love and I know you've seen, she's a bitch, I'm a bitch, I'm a boss. Yes. That idea of I'm a bitch, I'm a boss, that you have to be a bitch and, and as one of the hypotheses in your uh, book outlines, she's a bit of a bitch. And that talks to the likability index, doesn't it, about this idea of being likable. And I remember you mentioning Hillary. She said people used to say to her, she just wants it too much, mm. as if wanting to be, the, you know, presumably if you're actually campaigning to be the president, you should want to be the president. You should want to be the president. We talked to Hillary about the comparison with Beto O'Rourke, who you would remember was uh, questing for the primary. Ultimately, Joe Biden came through. But he famously had that Vanity Fair interview where he said, man, I was born for it to be president. And there was an adverse reaction to that. It mm. didn't go well for him. But when you look at that interview, he used other lines like, I'd be good at it. And they didn't get an adverse reaction. No. And you imagine... Imagine, you know, if Hillary or any other woman owned it as much of, as that, how adverse the reaction would be. And so we talk in the book about how we've interviewed these eight incredible leaders and when you talk to each of them, they tend to say things like, I was lucky, I was supported, I thought it was going to be someone else, I was surprised when it ended up being me. I had a great team. I had a great team. And I'm sure they're 100% genuine in all of those sentiments. But I also think as women, that's part of our learned sets of responses because we intuitively know that a woman who simply said, uh, I wanted to be a leader, I'm a good leader, I went for it, I got it, best person to do it, full stop, you know, that there would be, you know, a tidal wave of a reaction to that. I remember reading your biography after um, you left politics and I remember you were outlining the fact that you were, uh, you passed the most legislation of, of any I'm going to mangle it, but any <laughs> other government and it was a hung parliament and you were very, um, I was going to say boldly, but very factually stating your accomplishments. And I remember so clearly reading it and thinking, oh, goodness, like it felt, I won't say uncomfortable, but it felt daring right, to own your accomplishments. And I realised how unfamiliar that was, that, that we're so used to um, internalising that posture of, oh, I was lucky and I'm grateful and I kind of did this, but, you know anyone could have done it and, you know, lots of things were in my favour. How do you overcome that yeah, propensity to kind of defensive crouch? Yeah, it's interesting because I uh, record a podcast too, a podcast of one's cutting own. cutting my grass, Julia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I interviewed uh, Sally McManus from the ACTU and she's an amazing woman, but twice in the interview about subjects as diverse as soccer at school and studying philosophy at university, she said, and I was good at it. 
And I actually stopped her and said, I've interviewed all sorts of women on this podcast and no one ever just sits there and says, I was good at it, you yeah. know, and where do you find the confidence for that? And we had a really good conversation about this exact point and I don't know yet, you know, I don't feel settled in my mind around it um, because I think I would react adversely if I saw a woman on a stage just saying, you know, I took over leadership of the company and then our profits went up 20% and then we invented this new, you know, car or something and now we're the world leading business. I think I'd be saying, oh, you know, you reckon she'd just be indicating that perhaps she works with more than just herself and other people have yeah, been involved. Yeah, she's a bit full of herself. A bit full of herself. Yeah. We're so wired um, to expect women to do the collective thing but not mind at all when men don't, it's in us. And I think we're doing the one thing that we can which is going to get it out of us, which is talking about it and shining a light on it, and then we can second-guess ourselves when that's our first reaction. And instead of just going with it, we can say, hang on, if she's a corporate leader who's been that good, she's entitled to stand on a stage and say, I led... I led well and we achieved, you know, why don't we just let her do that? Other women's confidence and ambition can be confronting even to us as women, can't it? Yeah, when we talk about sexism and stereotyping, I think we fall for this um, sense that, oh, really we're talking about men and really we're talking about a small group of men and most people don't have those stereotypes in their head. What the psychological research shows, and we recount some but not all of it in the book, it's now a rich and diverse field, but what that research shows is that we've all got it in our heads. Yeah. Um, Hillary uh, uses uh, the expression when she speaks, she tells a little story about, you know, two fish swimming upstream and an older fish is coming downstream and the older fish says to the young fish, the water's mighty fine today. And one of the young fish turns to the other and says, what's water? Uh, because you know you're, it's the air we breathe yeah, it's what we swim in it's it's everywhere it's everything yeah. and so you're no longer conscious of how much it's around you we have as women a complicated relationship to the word ambition don't we i would never describe myself as ambitious and if someone else describes me as ambitious particularly a woman i know that's passive aggressive yeah. because it means um, i th- i would take it to mean she's a bitch she doesn't care about her kids It's really interesting, isn't it? Why do we have such a complicated word relationship with that word? Is it part of that internalised knowledge that we need to be likeable and an ambitious woman isn't likeable? I think it is. And it's, it's a very specific personal reaction because if someone said about you uh, she's ambitious for Mamma Mia she wants it to grow and that's fine and uh, we cite research in the book where uh, women if they are negotiating for their own pay rise will do themselves down Uh, whereas if they're negotiating for someone else's pay rise they will do it at least as well and often better than a man would do it for a colleague so we we don't mind being you know the lioness that will show tooth and claw to protect the pride, uh, but we don't do it ourselves. Um, And, you know, I guess you could say, let's take the future in two directions. Do we say it's okay for everybody to own ambition and for everyone to say, I made it, I did it? Or do we uplift the standard that we now apply to women and say that should also apply to men? And if we see a man who's standing there going, you know, I'm born for it, we go, you're a tosser. There's no way in the world I'm voting for you. <laughs> um, uh, and we equalise the treatment. You know, it's it's two contending visions of the future. And I'm not sure as feminists and activists we've quite settled on which one we're driving for. I was reading or I was listening to an interview with, I think it was Jen Palmieri who was Hillary's um, either her head of media and comms during the campaign and she was reflecting on, on the 26 campaign, 2016 campaign and she said that they became, she became aware all too late that they were trying to run Hillary as a male candidate, as a female version of a male candidate because they had no template for what a female candidate might be. And there's a part of, of your book where you talk about the style conundrum, shrill or soft, because there you had Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump literally screaming and shouting and being lauded for that 
And if she even raised her voice a decibel, she was described as shrill. Yes, absolutely. And all of the women in the book from an environments as diverse as Ellen Johnson's surleaf in Liberia, people might remember Liberia had the Ebola crisis, Joyce uh, Bander in Malawi, a poor country in Africa, through to, you know, Erna Solberg in Norway, Theresa May in the United Kingdom, Jacinta Ardern here, uh, Michelle Bachelet in Chile, Christine Lagarde, the head of the IMF. Um, you know, women working in different parts of the world, different contexts and cultures, all said they felt the force of this shrill or soft style conundrum and they self-limited behaviours because they knew it was waiting for them as a trap. When you were Prime Minister, how did you manage that? Like were were people constantly talking to you and were you thinking, second-guessing yourself about how you spoke, how assertive you were, how you needed to be soft or shrill? How did you navigate that? Yeah, It's not so much that people speak to you about it. I think you intuitively know it and there is... Look, I mean, I think in every politician and everybody who does a lot of public communication, you do have the voice in your head that's checking what you're saying as you say it. I think you become very good at that. And there's, you know, real reasons that you need to. You can't, as Prime Minister, be there uh, announcing the unemployment statistics and get the figures wrong. So you've got that second voice in your head going, yes, that's right, yes, that's right. Oh, hang on, you almost misrepresented that one. You need to go back and explain uh, but then that you also, figure again. Oh, I raised my voice. I'm, t- I'm talking too loudly. I need to yeah, and smile so, more. Yeah, that that voice does, I think, also speak to you on these style questions as a woman. And you do limit. You do know that if you get too punchy, um, that that will um, have a reaction. Um, if you get too soft, it will as well. I'm not saying you do that all day, every day. I mean, sometimes you just relax in the moment and you just go with it. Um, and, and people often all laud those as the most authentic appearances. But sometimes they do go wrong in this sense that you've been, um, you know, a bit tougher or a bit softer and then that becomes mm. the, the the narrative, the dialogue. It's just, it, it's not, um, you're not dancing on a pinhead Um, but it's a relatively narrow path and you can weave a bit this way and a bit that way, but there's certainly a sort of cliff to fall off either side. I'm old enough to remember when Bob Hawke was Prime Minister and he cried at a press conference when he was talking about his daughter and that was seen as being such a show of strength and sensitivity and what a wonderful father and what a wonderful person he was. Did you ever cry when you were Prime Minister publicly? Yes, I did. Um, I uh, uh, cried when we introduced the NDIS legislation. I remember uh, I remember giving the speech and becoming emotional about it. And when I sat down next to Wayne Swan, Wayne uttered the immortal words, would have had my money on Jenny being the one who cried because Jenny Macklin uh, was uh, known to shed a tear a bit more easily than me. Uh, I uh, cried when we did a condolence motion around uh, Australians lost in natural disasters. And I don't think on either of those occasions that I paid any price Mm. for it. Um, But... And and I'm not someone who sort of cries easily, so there weren't occasions when I was um, stifling back tears, but I do see in myself and see in others that it gets judged differently for women. Um, The most clear example with the women we talk to, and it really um, annoyed me so much. Is this Theresa May? Theresa May. Because it's funny you say this, I'll let you tell the story, but I didn't hear her speak, I just read the coverage and I assumed she was sobbing. Oh, no. Theresa May resigned as Prime Minister, so she gave one of those press conferences. I mean, obviously she was being uh, sort of hunted down by her political party and it became obvious she was going to have to go. So she's standing in front of Downing Street. She gives a, you know, address about the privilege it's been to lead the nation. And in the last line where she says something like, you know, it's been, you know, it's been the honour of my life to serve the nation I love, a line like that 
there was a quaver in her voice, a quaver. And then she turns around and goes back into Downing Street. And if you read the coverage, as yeah. you, as you even concluded, said to me, she you would have crying. thought she was she bawling, was bawling, they said to me. Yeah. And, and I'm like, oh, I wouldn't have picked that. And when we talked to her about it, her longtime media assistant, a woman called Liz, was with us. And Liz said she would take calls from journos who would literally, literally be asking not, um, has the Prime Minister cried? They, they were asking, can you tell us when she is going to cry? Stop. You know, um, it looks like, you know, in coming weeks she'll be under real pressure in the party room. Do you reckon she'll cry? Uh, so look, look, looks like her Brexit legislation's not going to get through the parliament. Do you reckon she'll cry? Um, so, <laughs> like, how bizarre is that? Did you cry when you left politics? No. No. Do you, I can't remember your final speech. No. No, I deliberately uh, – well, that was an occasion I made sure I didn't cry. Mm. Um, I was very focused on – yeah, actually, I, I said to you before I, there wasn't a time I stifled it, but I did. I mm. absolutely stifled it in that last speech. Um, I was determined um, to not give – you know, the press gallery and others the satisfaction um, of thinking they'd um, got to me. Uh, so, yeah, I, I've steeled myself um, very deliberately to not cry at my final press conference, even though uh, many male leaders have. Most of them have. It's funny, uh, speaking to both Kevin and um, Malcolm Turnbull about... Um, how dark things got for them after they left politics. Um, and I asked both of them if they had gone to therapy and they were both quite uh, not dismissive of me but dismissive of the idea because they both said someone would have leaked it and they would have been ridiculed for it. And I found that so sad, like sad in a different way in terms of the, the, the gender constraints that men are under as well. It is really sad but I'm not surprised that either of them said that mm. and I think there would have been, I mean, not the therapist. I mean, I wouldn't have expected Tony Abbott to go, but I just thought no. Malcolm Turnbull and Kevin would have been a little more, I don't know, a little bit more open to that, a little less. Oh, well, but but uh, well, I, I must admit I haven't listened to those podcasts, mm. but but was it that they weren't personally open? No, they were worried that, that it was going to be weaponised. Yeah, against yeah. them. And um, that... Unfortunately, it's not an irrational fear. Mm. Um, I mean, I. What did you do when yeah, you? Yeah, I, I didn't. Um, I didn't consider therapy, not because you know. I mean, obviously, yeah, with my Beyond, Beyond Blue, Blue hat on, <laughs> uh, we talked to people about help seeking and inter early intervention. If I thought I was getting into trouble, uh, then I definitely would have. Um, but for me, my healing kind of strategy was. Uh, retreat. You know, I needed to be in um, my own space with, you know, my my people, you know, the my long term friends, my family, um, and just grieve it a bit. And I wanted to do that, and also the times imposed that on me because I knew if I was spotted anywhere during the election campaign, that would have been used as a distraction, and I didn't want to be a distraction for Labor. You didn't want so, to be a miserable ghost. Yeah, well, you know, but even, I mean, realistically, if I'd just been um, sauntering through a shopping centre, the likelihood of um, someone ringing the media and getting shots and so that. So you were in lockdown, essentially, an early yeah, adopter of lockdown. An early adopter of lockdown. I spent the time in um, at home in Altona, uh, made sure I didn't get caught by cameras anywhere, went for walks each day, but carefully scouted out mm. walks. Um, I left uh, once, uh, I snuck a trip to Canberra to when the you know, everybody's cavalcade was well out of Canberra um, to have a farewell lunch with the senior public servants I'd worked with. And, you know, I managed to um, do that without getting caught anywhere, but I was really conscious of it. And it wouldn't have been, um, you know, it would... Simply been if I'd been out shoe shopping, someone had got that shot. It would have been, you know, uh, while uh, Kevin Rudd is uh, in the election campaign doing this, and unconcerned Julia Gillard's doing that. You know, it would have been played against the yeah. Labor campaign, even if it was an incredibly innocent action. And so I didn't want to fuel any of that. I wanted to ask you about diversity. You know, we've been talking so much about diversity 
since the Black Lives Matters protests. Something that's not spoken about much is diversity of class. And I think about your upbringing and the fact that, as you said, if, if it had been mentioned around the table in your very working class family that you would be one day prime minister, it would have been pretty laughable. How much of that do you think is, is important when we talk about inclusivity and diversity? Oh, incredibly important. Uh, I think that the easy assumption people make when they see political leaders and they see the fully formed product uh, is that they all came from quite upmarket backgrounds. Mm. Um, and one of the things we explore in the book is the backgrounds of each of the eight women leaders and in none of them you know, some of them more privileged than others, um, some of them very impoverished, um, but none of them came from the elite of their societies. They wouldn't, none of them came from the families that people would look at and say, um, you know, that's the kind of family that's going to have a politician in it, that's the kind of family where our next president or prime minister is going to come from. None of them were those kinds of families. The closest would be Michelle Bachelet from Chile. Her father was a general um, and so in a sort of a stratified elite in their society. But that all came to a crashing end for her uh, when there was the military takeover, the, the fascist dictatorship, and then her father was was imprisoned and tortured until he died uh, and she needed to, she was imprisoned and tortured as was her mother and her and her mother needed to flee into exile mm. so you know none of them came from that you know absolute top notch of society and had an easy seamless path through another type of diversity that that you that we've touched on is this um, physical diversity and and style diversity and i just think about Donald Trump and Boris Johnson, like I imagine a female, and you, you reference in the book as well, a female leader presenting herself like Boris Johnson who refuses to com to confirm how many children he has. <laughs> <laughs> no one, including and possibly him, actually knows. In Wikipedia it says somewhere between like four and seven. <laughs> and he looks like he's been dragged through a hedge backwards and that is his style. And you you, you compare that to Scott Morrison, to, um, you know, Malcolm Turnbull, to Donald Trump. I mean, there's a real, to Barack Obama, there's a real diversity of appearance, isn't there? And, and uh, you know, physicality. Are we getting closer to having that with women or you, we're still stuck on that, what Susan Sontag talks about, that one type of female beauty that we're all meant to be aiming for in uh, leadership? I, I'm partly smiling because I don't think we'll ever have the problem that a woman leader doesn't know imagine? how many children she has. <laughs> Can you please concern, <laughs> confirm, you know, Jacinda, how many children? I can't confirm. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I reckon uh, women would always be able to get the answer to that question, right? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I think we're um, we're still in the zone where, unfortunately, appearance matters for women, and and it it it's a judgment. This is a kind of a slippery concept to catch. We we try and uh, spell it out in the book, but it's judgments about appearance for women tend to easily become judgments about character. Yes. Because there's more diversity in dress. So what what are male leaders around the world wear? Where they well, wear suits or um, some would wear the traditional dress of their countries. So, um, you know, an Indian uh, Prime Minister, for example, as Prime Minister Modi does, uh, wears a traditional Indian style of dress. But it's you know, it's kind of a uniform. Um, whereas for women, um, people think that they can tell something about ca character and something about the kind of woman she is from how she dresses. And I think the problem for a female version of Boris Johnson, it wouldn't be limited to people saying... Um, 
doesn't she own a comb? Um, you know, hasn't she ever heard of a blow dryer? Um, it, it wouldn't be limited to that. No. It would be the additional problem that people would say a woman who allows herself to appear that unkempt is a woman without self-regard, work ethic, discipline, mm. um, you know, uh, those old-fashioned words like slatten mm. and, and words like that, all ugly words about women, um, they, they apply to her. And yet for Boris, it's viewed as... Charming. An amusing eccentricity. Endearing. Yeah, you know, and, and it's something amusing eccentricity, mm. a bit correlated with being British posh. Yeah. Um, and that's okay, apparently. Uh, so it, it plays out differently. The the question of children, however many Boris does or doesn't have, um, is another one that you talk about um, who's minding the kids in terms of it's a real double-edged sword because you had um, – insults and presumptions made that you couldn't possibly understand a whole bunch of things because you didn't have children and then we've seen with Jacinda and all the female leaders that you talk to who've got children who've been accused of either neglecting their children or neglecting the country that they're trying to lead. Um, Jacinda, what was your experience talking to Jacinda about it? Because having a baby while you're leading a country, that's a new thing. She's the third female Prime Minister of New Zealand and therefore has had an easier go of it not being the first. But this is new. Yes, she's the uh, second woman ever uh, to give uh, birth in office. The uh, other one was uh, President Bhutto of uh, Pakistan. Mm, who he hid her pregnancy. Who hid her pregnancy. Um, so what did she do? She just went one day... I've had a baby. Basically, um, wow. yeah, she, she. I mean, it, it was a different age, obviously, to mm. in terms of media exposure. Um, so uh, easier to do, impossible to do now, impossible, mm. uh, easier to do then. Um, but still that she felt the political pressure that she had to do that. Um, you know, I, uh, speaking to Jacinda, she's very thoughtful about what it means and the ways that her own experience can um, help other women. So, you know, the fact that they very publicly talk about uh, how her uh, partner is the primary uh, carer for their young daughter. Uh, she talks about how women have approached her and written to her and saying, you know, thank you for doing that because it's helped me be um, more uh, upfront about my family's uh, caring arrangements because we do that and people have thought it was strange and now it seems more normal because you do it. And she's, you know, very upfront about I don't get it all right and I don't feel like it's balanced. I just try and make it work and do the best I can and I, I you know, in part get it done because of a lot of people's support and we have a mm. family network that's incredibly strong. And so she's very open about all of that and I think that gives women um, the opportunity to be open about their own struggles too and to not make it look like you know we turn out of the door every day looking perfect ready to go for work and we never have any problems making this all add up. You write also in fact one of the the, the second hypothesis in the book is it's all about the hair and I, it's funny because when I saw um, a photo of you recently I was like oh her hair looks great. <laughs> I was also very interested in what you were doing, <laughs> but I did think that your hair looked great. Um, you, you you talk extensively um, with all the women in the book and Hillary t- w- um, states that she worked out that she spent 25 days during the campaign getting her hair and makeup done and faffing around with clothes, which is like a tax that men don't have to pay. It's like a tax on, on female leaders' time. Absolutely. I mean, it's stra- staggering statistic, you know, that many days are lost to getting hair and makeup mm. done. And yet if she hadn't done it, she probably would have lost so. more days to the um, uh, coverage about it. And this is, I think it's very, it raises very basic questions about how we see uh, male, how we see and judge male and female appearance. We talk in the book, uh, there's a beautiful uh, quote by a philosopher, Susan Sontag, 
who talks about how we easily incorporate uh, two standards of male beauty. So you can be viewed as a, an attractive man because you, um, you know, that sort of boy band, young, smooth skinned attractiveness that every boy band across the ages has always had, the sort of, you know, original version of Justin Bieber, mm. that kind of look. Uh, we view that as attractive. But we also view uh, Sean Connery as attractive, so older, rougher, lined, heavier. Um, with women, we really only have the first standard. We have the youthful standard. And every year or part of ageing that takes you further away from that standard is, in Susan Sontag's words, viewed as a defeat. Yeah. And I think... That is true. We don't really have those older images of um, women. And so female leaders, women in the public eye, have to strive as much as they can to still maintain this earlier, younger look. And it's just um, burdensome mm. uh, time-wise. And the option they don't have available to them is the option that basically every male leader in the world exercises, which is, uh, you know, they have a shower, uh, have a shave. Obviously, women don't have to do that, shave their face, but have a shower, have a shave, get a suit on, walk out the door. Mm. Um, you know, Hillary Clinton, no one could have done that. Uh, and that doesn't mean, you know, that for women who are vitally interested in fashion and it's their pleasure and their fun and their hobby and that's what they like to do and they like to pick clothes and uh, they can't imagine a world where they're doing anything other than that. They like to think about what they're going to wear. That's perfectly legitimate. I'm like that. So, I'm like that. Yeah. I love it. And Julie Bishop was like that. And Theresa May. And uh, Theresa loves her shoes. Loves her shoes. And um, Julie said the same thing that you said in the book, which is both of you were advised to wear bright coloured jackets like canary yellow and bright red and bright pink. And she said she did that for a while. And then she was like, that's not me. I don't want to do that. I want to wear, you know, black and I want to wear sequins sometimes. And she gets real joy from that. I don't get the vibe that that's your joy. No, I mean, I, um, uh, it, it's never been a particular interest of mine, yeah. um, you know, fashion. I mean, everybody likes to, you know, look sort of good enough. But uh, if I had uh, discretionary time on a Saturday afternoon, uh, I would. You wouldn't uh, be with me at Westfield. Uh, I wouldn't be with you at Westfield. <laughs> and in terms of my reading material, uh, a fashion magazine, wow, I would have to have gone through every book in the house and had my Kindle <laughs> uh, broken down uh, before I'd uh, be reaching for a fashion magazine. Uh, that's just not me. Um, so how did you approach it oh, when you were Prime Minister? Yeah, look, it's um, it's sort of just an, another task, really. I mean, you can't, uh, you can't just wander around shopping because you'd get crowds everywhere and so, um, you know, and security issues and all the rest and of it. And also you had a country to run. And you had a country to run. So you wanted to make it as quick as possible. Uh, so you would have um, uh, people who would, you know, bring clothes for you to try on to where you were, the lodge, um, uh, maybe Kirribilli if I was in Sydney, and you'd select some of them and then the rest of them would go back and you'd try. Well, I would try and do it as quickly as possible. You settled on a look quite early on, which was tailored jackets, pants mostly. Yep. And you just, and like sort of camisole things underneath and you just seem to get on with it. And you talk in the book about your advice towards the end for women is to pick a look, pick and stick really. I mean, Angela Merkel's got her look with her pants and her jackets. Um is that something that was that that's helpful because it's just one more decision you don't have to make and also it attracts less commentary? Uh, what we try and do in the book is not say um, this is the way to do it. Um, and, you know, for example, Theresa May wouldn't give that advice. I mean, she mm. um, she was uh, known for, probably still known for her, her love of fashion. She's interested in shoes. Uh, she gave the speech that uh, brought her to public prominence first was to a Conservative Party conference. She gave it wearing leopard uh, skin kitten heels. Um, and, you know, she talks in the book about how years later she got in a lift in the House of Commons and a young woman said to her, I'm working here because of your shoes. You know, the first thing that interested that woman, young woman in following anything to do with Theresa May or politics was that she liked the pair of shoes she was wearing. Um, so, you know, there's no right answer. 
Mm. Uh, but what we're trying to say is be aware of the consequences. The day after you became Prime Minister, you gave a speech and you wore a jacket. And yes. what happened after that? Uh, we've referred to it ever since as the uh, jacket that divided a nation. <laughs> Jacket. Oh, honestly, um, it was uh, uh, it was a th- it it was Canberra. It was winter, so it was bloody cold. And I was going to a shopping centre, so um, in a car park, up through the lift, walk through a shopping centre, talking to people, um, and then back in, in into the car. And it was a sort of three quarter length, um, you know, coloured uh, jacket. What like. colour was it? Was it lots of colours? Like I'm trying to remember what could yeah, possibly have uh, been so notable about it, it to it, divide it, a nation. It was, it was multicoloured. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, mm. um, but and oh, so then, what was the coverage? Oh, uh, everything. I mean, all of the TV news, the newspapers, front pages, dial-in polls. <laughs> um, what you, what you thought about the jacket? Uh, <laughs> and this is day one. Uh, yeah, that was, so that wasn't the day I was sworn in. That was the next day. But you know what? I um, I, I feel like I feel like we're impeaching the jacket um, in a van, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not and I'm not sure it was the jacket's fault. Yeah. Uh, maybe it wasn't the smartest uh, choice in the world. But I suspect that whatever I had worn that second day would have been the subject of commentary. So if I'd gone for the most neutral um, suit look in the world, you know, a uh, 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 navy, uh, very traditional uh, female suit, um, I reckon the commentary would have been um, clearly uh, motivated to adopt a classically tailored look the Prime Minister on her first full day in office was wearing, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, there would have been no way out of it, mm. and uh, should have worn sequins and really messed with their heads. Oh God! And <laughs> if you, you yeah, imagine? yeah. Uh, well, I think uh, that that would have been a problem. I remember Cheryl Kernow and the feather boa I and do. all of that kind of stuff. I mean, uh, these things become the caricature. What would you have done differently? Uh, look, I don't. Would think... Would you have called out the commentary? You said you said there are two things as far as gender goes that you would have done differently. Yeah, I, with the benefit of a time machine. With the benefit of a time machine, I would call it out earlier. I thought it would, um, you know, equalise over time. My tr- gender would be a part of the reception of the first female prime minister, but not an ongoing feature. So I thought you just wait it out and it'll sort itself out. Um, that wasn't right, and so I missed the moment to take issue with it originally. So could I, in those early weeks, if the commentary, as it did, was often on my clothes, could I, should I, in those early weeks have said at a press conference, you know, after going out to make an announcement about an important government policy, uh, could I have said, um, now, you know, the substance of this discussion is about the economy or whatever, um, if you're motivated to write a piece out of this that is about what I'm wearing today, I'd invite you to have a think about whether you would have done that had this announcement been made by a male prime minister. And I think some of you know there would have been a sort of throwing back of heads, and some in the Canberra press gallery would have thought they'd been insulted. Um, some would have been very defensive. Um, it would have obscured the news in the actual announcement because they all would have talked about that. Uh, but maybe it might have, uh, you know... Named got, and shamed a little got bit. ..got them thinking, and mm. then next time they did it, uh, perhaps it wouldn't have been quite the same. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome.